Welcome for this lunchtime devotion. Uh, I think uh, today's reading is on the genealogy of Jesus. And uh, some people find uh, it very, 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 what I said, boring. All the names, who begin, who, who begin, who, and all that. Uh, but today I want to share with you why it's, it's important. Why it's important, okay? Okay, this ge genealogy, what's all genealogy? It's all, all about your, in a way, uh, your family tree, lah. Okay, literally, that's what it means. Genealogy. Okay. Now, in the Bible, genealogy is important. It's important because it just shows that God knows each one of us by name, and God cares, and God caused it to be written in His Word. So the the Old Testament is full of genealogies, who the father of who, and all that. So it just tells us that God is the one who knows knows us by name and cares for us individually as, a, as people of His. I think that's important, okay? Secondly, <clears throat> it's a source of historical accuracy. Means who is the father of who, who is the son of who, then we can trace in the way God's guidance throughout history. So there's a lot of historicity in it. Who beget who, who beget who, tells us uh, the whole family tree as such and can trace it. I think that's important, okay? And in many sense, it confirms prophecies. Prophecies given the Old Testament, how it's fulfilled the New Testament. And this is all the more important when I talk about the Messiah. Okay, the coming Messiah, the coming Savior. Now, not necessarily important in the Bible, but to the Jews, genealogy is especially very important. Okay, one is for the Jews, the genealogy said to say is all male oriented. It goes to the father, father, father side. The, the, the mother side is uh, a lot of times not kept, but all the inheritors all through the male side. Okay, the Jewish society as such. Huh? Now, for a Jew to be able to know your genealogy in the way can prove that you are a Jew, that you are descended from Abraham, the friend of God, right in the Old Testament. So a Jew will be very careful to try to trace all their genealogies back, as far back as possible. And in the early days, okay, as far as the Jews are concerned, they kept very good genealogical records. Okay, only after that, when the temple was burned in AD 70 by the Romans, a lot of the records were burned and lost. Okay, but they are still trying to reconstruct it. Uh, reconstruct it. Okay, so, so for a Jew, it's part of their identity. Okay, I think some of the Chinese know the same thing. Like I know that in my ancestral village in China, uh, we are asked to put our names there, our names, our children there. Okay, so for the Jews, it's especially important, not only for their own identity as a race, a Jewish race, okay, but also for where they stay and how the inheritance are. Because you know that the Jews had 12 tribes and each portion was given to different tribes and all that. So in the uh, Old Testament days, New Testament days, where you stay and your inheritance is tied up to the uh, family tree that you come from. You come from Judah, it's different. Okay, uh, you, you, you come from another tribe, Benjamin, is different again. Okay, so all this tied up in the Jewish culture and inheritance, okay. And the whole area of Levitical priesthood, if you want to be a, say you are Levite, you are, uh, you want to be a priest, you must prove that you come from the line of Levi, the whole family tree of Levi. And that's very important. And you read about it in the, after the exile in Babylon, when they come back, some people had their family tree, no problem, you are priests. But some people cannot, they are not clear because their family tree is uh, not clear. So they got to wait until the emperor's sanctuary order, the Urim and the Tumim and decide whether you are real or not, a priest or not, okay? So there's the importance in the Jewish culture. And whole area of family bond, if they know that you are this, in a way, uh, from this line, the bond is much stronger, much, much better, okay? And obviously, the final one is the Messianic title, a son of David. From Old Testament, you talk about son of David. In the New Testament, all the Jews know that this son of David is also the Messiah, the promised saviour for the Jews. That's why when Jesus is the word son of David, the Pharisees and Sadducees get very upset. How can you claim to be the Messiah? Okay, 
So we have talked about son of David, which means that you must prove your lineage from the, the line of David all the way down. So this is the importance of the so-called genealogies to the Jews. Okay. Now a few remarks before we proceed. Okay. Now the genealogies are accurate, but need not be comprehensive. Means they did not trace everybody, every generation. Okay, if you, you read carefully the uh, Matthew version, the Luke version, not every generation is listed, but they choose some generation to put 14, 14, 14. Okay, and they have reason for it. Thirdly, the genealogists, especially in Matthew, there are additional comments. Okay, uh, this person, okay, talk about Tama, this person talk about uh, Rahab and all that, because these are ladies but they are included in the Matthew genealogy for a reason, as we will see afterwards. Okay, so genealogy is not just who is the father of who, the son of who, that, that's all, but there are additional comments put in to tell us the stories of the genealogy. Okay, I'm going to show a short video, okay, of this uh, bishop that uh, explains some of the stories within the genealogy. Okay. You know, the gospel for Christmas Day is the famous prologue to John's gospel. In the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. The Word became flesh and dwelt among us. That, of course, is the hinge upon which all the Christianity turns. That God's eternal Word enters into the sort of muck and mud and dysfunction of our human condition. He really becomes flesh. I find, though, that to get a better feel for that, the sort of texture of it, it's good to go to the beginning of Matthew's Gospel, because John's statement can sound a little bit abstract, the Word became flesh. But if you look in um, Matthew, his Gospel begins with this famous genealogy, all of the ancestors of Jesus. And keep in mind that if Jesus had a mother, so God has a mother, it also means that God had a grandmother, God had a great-grandfather, God had cousins, God had aunts, God had weird uncles. God entered into all of the ambiguity of our human condition. And the genealogy of Matthew really brings this out, I think, very beautifully. And mind you, it's the first thing you read in Matthew, which means the first thing you read in the whole New Testament is this genealogy. And I bet most of us, um, upon picking up uh, Matthew's Gospel would say, oh yeah, Abraham became the father of Isaac, the father of Jacob, the father of Perez and Zerah. We say, yeah, blah, blah, blah. Let's get to the you know, Christmas story. But that's a mistake, because this is a very telling um, uh, part of the Gospel. We hear, for example, that one of Jesus' ancestors is Jacob. Now, who is Jacob? A great hero, certainly. One of the great patriarchs of Israel. But Jacob was also someone who famously wrestled with God. We have that beautiful account in Genesis of Jacob wrestling all night with God and then being wounded permanently as a result. I bet there are a lot of people watching this video right now who have spent a lot of their lives wrestling with God. Believe in God, yes. Take God seriously, yes. But have doubts, have questions, anxieties. Maybe during times of failure and suffering, you wonder, God, what are you doing? Wrestle with God. And maybe because of that, you might even be spiritually wounded, the way Jacob was wounded permanently by the struggle. Okay. Christ was pleased to have Jacob, this wrestler with God, as one of his ancestors. He's pleased to have us who wrestle with God as members of his family. You know what else is mentioned here, which is really extraordinary, is... Rahab. One of Jesus' ancestors is Rahab. Do you know her story? She was a prostitute. So when the Israelites are coming into the promised land, they have to conquer these cities. And Rahab gave um, uh, protection to the Israelite spies. So when they finally come into the city, uh, she's, uh, she's preserved. You, know? um, you think anybody who wants to tell a sort of neat, uh, politically correct, cleansed story would find a way to drop Rahab out. You know, let's just not mention Rahab. There she is, right in the beginning of the New Testament. One of Jesus' ancestors was a prostitute. 
Are there people listening to me right now who maybe feel, look, I'm such a sinner. What would God ever have to do with me? I'm not a mild sinner. I'm a serious sinner. You know, and so a long time ago, I just wrote off God. And God, I'm sure, wrote me off. I don't know. Right there in the Bible, right there in the genealogy of Jesus, we hear about Rahab. Jesus was pleased to have a prostitute as one of his ancestors. Now, I'm not approving of prostitution, don't get me wrong, but he's the descendant of Rahab. Is he pleased to have, yes, even serious sinners in his spiritual family? Absolutely. You know what else is mentioned here is Ruth. Now, Ruth's story you can read in her book, the book of Ruth. And it's fascinating. Ruth is not an Israelite. She was a Moabite. She was an outsider, not an Israelite. But she married into an Israelite family, and when her husband died, she remained loyal to her mother-in-law, and she went back from her country to Israel to live with the mother-in-law. Where'd she go? She went to a little town called Bethlehem. And in that town, she eventually married, and she becomes the grandmother of Jesse. Jesse, who in turn is the father of David, the greatest king in Israelite history. Jesus is the son of David. Well, he's the great, David is the great grandson of Ruth. I bet there are people listening to me right now, watching this video, who feel, you know, I'm kind of an outsider. I, I'm not in the in group. I, I'm not one of the approved people. I, I'm a, like a foreigner. I, I'm on the outskirts of things. Well, Jesus is pleased to have as one of his ancestors, Ruth, who is not Israelite, who is a Moabite woman. Don't feel that you're unworthy of being in Christ's family if you feel like an outsider. And then how about David, whom I already um, alluded to? David, clearly the greatest king in Israel, arguably the greatest figure, period, in the whole Old Testament. The slayer of Goliath, the one who gathered the tribes, who conquered Jerusalem, brought the Ark of the Covenant. He's the archetypal king of Israel. And he's a murderer and he's an adulterer. Read the story in 2 Samuel about uh, Bathsheba and what David does, you know, in the wake of, of his illicit affair with Bathsheba. I bet there are people listening to me right now watching this video who perhaps are very powerful like David, powerful in, in industry or business or politics. And maybe you feel you've got a hidden sin. Maybe you've abused your power in some way. Jesus is pleased to have David, this murderer and adulterer, as his ancestor. He's pleased to have you, too, as a member of his family. Here's the last one. Also in this genealogy, we hear about Azor, Eliakim, and Zadok. Who were they? No one knows. <laughs> no one knows who they were or what they did. I bet there are some people listening to me right now, watching this video, feel like, look, I I'm just a nobody. I mean, what have I ever accomplished? Who am I? Well, Jesus is pleased to have these figures as his ancestors. The point is, the word becomes flesh. Allow Matthew to tell you what that feels like and looks like, what the texture of that is. It means that God pushes into our very dysfunctional, ambiguous family. And see, that is incomparably good news for us who are members of the same kind of dysfunctional family. That is the great good news of God's incarnation. Okay, I'm glad. Uh, I hope that small snippet will help each one of us uh, to the application for what you have just read. Okay, now uh, just a slight explanation. Okay, uh, you've been asked and just today in staff devotion why the Matthew and the Luke account differs. Okay, especially uh, after David all the way to Joseph, and yet Joseph is a common link. Okay. There are different explanations for this. Uh, some people say Matthew is from Joseph's side. Actually, Luke is from Mary's side and all that. Okay, which, uh, well, is possible. Uh, but normally, as I said at the beginning, genealogy normally follows the father. Okay, you don't hardly follow the mother's side. That's not Jewish genealogy. Okay, that's something you consider. Uh, now, uh, the other thing to keep in mind is that uh, as, as uh, this bishop uh, referred to, even the women included in Matthew's account is included as a mother or somebody. 
as a mother or somebody. It means they are just tied in a, a, a linkage, but not a genealogy. Okay, so we have, we have this whose mother was Tama in verse uh, 3, okay, and goes on to verse uh, 5, whose mother was Rehab, whose mother was Ruth. No? So all these ladies' names are tied in because uh, not on the direct genealogy, but as a link, because they are mother to somebody. Okay, and uh, very interestingly, the, the ladies that are there, and it has been suggested that uh, the ladies' names are put there Okay, just to, as well as Matthew, we talked about yesterday, uh, Henry will talk about Matthew as a book to the Jews. Okay, so in Jewish history, that is important to show that each and every one of these women have a colorful past. Tama got to sleep with the father-in-law. Okay, uh, uh, the whole area of Rehab, a prostitute. All these people have a colorful history, Bathsheba and all. And yet they are part of the lineage as rec recorded in Matthew. So I think this lays the foundation for also Mary. Mary was betrothed, but not married. And she was with child. Okay, so there's another angle for us to consider. Uh, that when you talk about Matthew and all that to a Jewish audience, people say, hey, where can uh, Mary, who is just betrothed, not married, be having a child? Okay, you can say, oh, look back at what the history is. Tama, what Tama did, what Rehab is, and what Bathsheba did. I, I think all these are things for us to consider as we talk about it. Okay, and to explain the two so-called genealogies and Matthew and Luke. Okay, yes, I, 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 I'm wondering about it. I think my best explanation is... The Bible is accurate. That's my premise. Okay. How many of you use the driving program Waze? How many of you use, use Waze? Okay, I hope you all use Waze. Okay. Now, you know that you can put Waze from my house to, let's say, Henry's house. Okay. You show me the so-called shortest route or the cheapest route, depending on how you set. But in order for me to go from my house to Henry's house, there's not only one way, there are many ways. I can take the North East Highway, I can take the NPE, okay? But the ultimate is, I will reach Henry South. And to me, I, as, as I ponder about it, this is a very apt illustration for Matthew and Luke. The whole idea of Matthew and Luke genealogy is to go from David to Joseph. Those are two points. Okay, but which route you take through Solomon or through Nathan, it doesn't matter. At the end of it, David is there and Joseph is there. Beginning and the end. That is the important part. So a lot of people intermarry and all that. Yes, there are different ways to trace the thing. But we'll still reach the end point of Joseph. And Joseph, Mary and Jesus. Uh, that to me is a very uh, clear illustration uh, of what the Bible is trying to teach us in genealogy. It's very important. It is not boring. There are many stories for us to learn as this bishop has rightly pointed out that God accepts people who have wrestled with him. God accepts people who have a very colorful past. God accepts people who are no bodies. A lot of the names from uh, the last 14, you don't know who they are from the Bible history, but they are included to show that anybody is not a nobody to God, but God accepts you and God receives you and you have a place in God's plan and God's purpose.